Welcome back. Last week, we saw the fulfillment of hopes and dreams for Providence Island as a privateering base. Company members were preparing to relocate to the colony. They reduced civilian rents and increased liberties, and things should have been better than ever. But the focus on privateering put civilians and soldiers so deeply at odds that the civilians rebelled against the company yet again. This week, Rishworth's return with the civilian petition will be the tipping point which sees the company pushed over the edge into irrecoverable failure. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tinsalvola, a show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. And meanwhile, in England, the investors were engaged in a revolt of their own. In early 1637, John Hamden was put on trial for refusing to pay the ship money demanded by the king. John Hamden was closely related to the Providence Island Company, though not an investor, but he was defended by investor Oliver St. John, and multiple other investors showed up at his trial. Warwick, for instance, appeared and told the king that if he recalled Parliament, they would give him the money he wanted. The fact that everyone involved in Hamden's trial was also involved with the Providence Island Company didn't escape the king's attention. He started to wonder if investor meetings were being used to organize opposition to him. Concerned with the threat, he started to scrutinize the company more closely and denied Warwick permission to move to the island. Unbeknownst to the colonists, he had been planning to move there and take the position of governor to restore order to the colony, and Say and Brooke had planned to join him. And in response to increased scrutiny, the company stopped recording the proceedings at investor meetings, and meeting attendance dwindled even more. Soon, only five people were attending the meetings. And privateering wasn't exactly helping them recoup their losses. Prizes and slave trading now comprised the majority of their revenue, but these weren't reliable sources of income. Captains clearly weren't adhering to their side of the agreement to give the company a percentage of their gains, and prizes could be lost as fast as they were captured. Thomas Newman, for instance, was the most successful privateer of the era, but he lost tens of thousands of pounds worth of loot when he was attacked by Dunkirkers. And in a separate incident, Newman reported that his ally for one raid, Diego El Mulatto, had cheated him of yet more thousands of pounds when he took sole possession of a rich prize and took it to the Netherlands without giving Newman his half. The company sent an agent to the Netherlands to recover what they could, but they knew that they had little hope of getting anything back. Giles Murch, the now captain of the Expectation, arrived back in England at this point after months and months at sea and after having lost the company yet more thousands of pounds. And the company sued him for this in Admiralty Court, but that just increased debt even more. So at this point, just months after their hopes were at their highest ever, Things were disheartening enough that the company held a meeting to decide whether or not to actually continue the venture. They were again at the point of having to figure out their finances, and still nothing was going their way. And at this point, the Earl of Holland came to a meeting, something he never, ever did, bringing news from the king that the king was still committed to keeping the colony going, 
even if that meant giving some money or rendering some other assistance. And Holland and the investors spent the rest of that meeting drawing up a list of proposals for the king's support and involvement. The problem was, though, that the king couldn't just sign off on anything. Any such proposal had to go through the right committees and sometimes bounce among committees, including the Lords and Commissioners for Plantations, the Admiralty Court, and the Attorney General. The Lords Commissioners for Plantations was headed by Archbishop Laud, who was thoroughly hostile to the Puritans, and one can imagine that the Attorney General, who had just been involved in the court case against John Hamden, wasn't much more sympathetic. The king did give them the permission to sell to the Dutch, but the Dutch now waffled on paying the originally offered £70,000, so the deal fell through. The investors decided, though, that continuing the project was worth it, if only because Providence Island could help them fight the Spanish and the spread of Catholicism. It was also a good base from which to spread to the mainland, which, in addition to being profitable, would also help chip away at the Spanish Empire. Privateers weren't just capturing valuable prizes, they were also raiding coastal settlements and the ships supplying them, something which, though it yielded virtually nothing of value, chipped away at the Spanish Empire and prepared for English expansion by making life in those towns virtually unbearable, even pushing some towns to the brink of starvation. So at the very least, it was a good enough foreign policy asset to keep investing in. In addition to this, Holland had indicated that the king might be willing to exempt investors from customs duties and admiralty dues. Though honestly, I don't quite see how they could have expected that to happen, given their previous fights with the king. But anyway, investors decided to create yet another joint stock, with almost identical terms to the last one. They would get priority for the next nine years, and only After that, would members of the first joint stock be paid, and only after that would the initial investments be taken into account. And this is when Rishworth returned with the petition. The fact that civilians had mutinied yet again was a turning point for Providence Island. In no other colony have we seen such a rebellion after the economic breakthrough which should have saved the colony. And the investors were furious. But when Rishworth returned to England, he lost his nerve. He was one of the most belligerent civilians on Providence Island, which you can imagine is probably why the civilians chose to send him with the petition. But facing the company, some of the richest, most famous men in England, he was suddenly meek, timid, and he did virtually nothing except to say that the petition accurately represented how the civilians felt. When investors demanded to know exactly how the civilians dared to rebel after they had given them so much, Rishworth just replied that Well, the petition explained everything, and, you know, the civilians were just hoping to be included in mainland ventures when that did, in fact, become possible. He did stand more firmly by the criticism of the store clerks, saying that their behavior truly couldn't stand scrutiny. But when he did, the incensed investors confronted him with accusations about his own behavior being dishonest. And to that, Rishworth responded that if he'd done anyone even five pounds worth of wrong, he'd not only pay them back, he would humble himself publicly. 
The investors couldn't have been more disgusted. They said the ultimatum was full of weakness in them, of injustice to us, and which is worst of all, unthankfulness to God who had so wonderfully preserved them. And you can kind of see why. We've seen time and again that all concessions in the colonial sphere were made with some level of resentment. And that's because the stakes were so high, involving crippling sums of money, life and death, and the most fundamental of issues and ideals. The investors hadn't just given colonists token concessions. They had altered their own vision to placate them. And they had asked for less rent, even though they themselves were now facing crippling debt due to the colony's lack of productivity, a lack of productivity which they were still pretty sure was the colonists' fault. They expected at least some appreciation, and instead they got not just complaints, but an actual threat to desert the island completely. And even worse, the colonists hadn't given the company any warning, either privately or publicly, before going to the most extreme action possible. But in the colonists' defense, from their perspective, life on the island was now much, much worse, more ungodly, and more dangerous than it had ever been in England. Their fundamental concerns, being ruled by domineering libertine soldiers and sailors, had only gotten worse. And at this point, Bell started voicing his own demands of the company. He wanted payment for his service as governor. And like Rishworth's, Bell's petition got into a little bit of murky ground regarding who was right and wrong. On the one hand, it's true that Bell hadn't been paid as he'd been promised repeatedly. He had repeatedly asked for compensation, and the company had repeatedly wavered. And he was owed some payment for the service he'd performed in the colony. But on the other hand, Bell, overwhelmed by resentment at both the company and the colonists for his treatment on Providence Island, grossly overestimated how much he was owed. He said that for most of his five-year term, he had lacked as many as 25 of his 32 promised servants, and that each of those servants could have raised 10 pounds worth of crops per year, so he was owed 1,250 pounds. Or, alternately, he said, they could calculate based on the actual amount of tobacco that the servants could have grown, 200 pounds weight, which would mean that he was owed 1,047 pounds. So they could choose. But firstly, as the company pointed out, he was calculating at the absolute 100% maximum that any servant could have produced not the average, and the absolute maximum that the tobacco could theoretically have been sold for, neither of which had ever happened on Providence Island. Second, they hadn't offered bell servants until 1632, so he was calculating for more years than he was entitled to. And third, Bell himself had suggested that they delay sending the servants until the island was ready for them, and in return, the company had cancelled out some of his debts. And fourth, just because he was lacking in servants didn't mean he hadn't been sent them. Some had run away or died, so the company acknowledged that they probably owed him some money but they said that what he was asking 
was absolutely ridiculous, and there wasn't a chance in this world that they were going to pay it. And while the investors seethed in disgust at Bell, at Rishworth, at the colonists in general, they had to face their own economic reality. They were bringing in prizes, even 15,000 pounds worth in one shipment, but they lost far more than they ever successfully brought back, and their debts continued to climb. Both Bell and Rishworth said that the island was in far better shape than the investors had thought, And they also both reiterated that it simply wasn't a good place to grow crops. Its best use was as a privateering base. They brought a report from Blaufeld, which said that the island could support 1,200 settlers if it focused exclusively on growing provisions, but it could only support six to 700 if it also tried to grow commodities. The biggest problem with the island was that immediately after clearing land to grow crops, the land would be invaded by coarse, thick grass, which was harder to control than the original foliage had been, sometimes growing as much as an inch per day. So it was a constant uphill battle to keep the grass from choking out the crops. But it just wasn't great land anyway. The soil was clay, and livestock may have survived, but it just didn't thrive. They said that salt was the only really valuable commodity that they could produce. And tobacco was completely worthless. Again. The temporary price recovery was completely over. And even worse, at this point, reports started to trickle in about a slave revolt on Association Island. The company had sent a second group of settlers there after the Spanish had wiped out the first group, naming privateer Nicholas Riskinner as governor. But Riskinner had soon died, leaving 80 English and 150 slaves to fend for themselves. And tensions quickly escalated into a revolt, in which the slaves drove all the English from the island, the first successful slave revolt in English America. The investors again turned their attention to Kamek's flax, and calculated that if they could just find a method which allowed one man to clear five pounds of fiber per day, it would at least be a moderately profitable commodity. So they prepared orders for colonists to start collecting it and experimenting with ways to clean it and they urged the planting of provisions for privateers plus commodities and issued orders expressly forbidding the riotous feasting that they believed colonists were engaged in, and they ordered the colonists to stop growing tobacco, saying it was a completely pointless endeavor at this point. And at this point, they realized that they wouldn't get financial help from the king, and their deadline to pay the money that they had promised two years before was now up. And they hadn't sent the additional settlers they'd promised. The only thing they could do was extend the order, give themselves a little more time, and try getting more money. And yet again, Brooke committed twice as much as anyone else. But at this point... William Woodcock, the company husbandman, died, which put the company even deeper in debt because all ownership of company goods went through him. So it left a huge amount of money in a gray zone where ownership was unclear. Did it belong to the company 
or to Woodcock's heirs. And then a merchant made off with 600 pounds that they had advanced him to buy two pinnaces. They anticipated a slight reprieve when Captain Newman and New Englander William Pierce arrived in the Merry Hope and the Desire with over 1,500 pounds worth of prizes, but thanks to Woodcock's death, they couldn't actually get any of it, and just trying increased their debt even more. To put things in context, in this year, the Spanish claimed that the Providence Island-based privateers had captured 300,000 pounds worth of goods, which should have given the company at least 60,000 pounds, but instead, the company slipped even further into debt because they had a net loss of money. They were repeatedly cheated and lied to, and on top of that, they had horrible luck. Every colony dealt with this to some extent, but a lot of the cheating came from mariners, and the Providence Island Company had chosen to rely almost exclusively on mariners for income, so the problem there was worse. After the petition, the company also decided to replace Hunt as governor. He was completely on the civilian side, and he didn't seem to be competent to run the colony. They put Hunt in charge of Black Rock Fort, ordered Elfrith to return to England, and they sent Nathaniel Butler to take Hunt's position as governor. One of Warwick's long-term associates, Butler had a successful track record, both as a privateer and as a colonial governor. He had preceded Bell as governor of Bermuda, and there he had done a lot to resolve faction fighting among settlers. He had a natural sense of ceremony and grandeur, even building a small Venetian-style palace in Bermuda. He was firm, he was intelligent, he was experienced, and he was confident. And because of this, he demanded more from the investors than any previous governor had. For one, he demanded a salary. None of this servants and land business. And second, he emphasized the need for the company to give him actual power and authority on the island. He firmly and correctly insisted that the company's inconsistent and contradictory orders from England had increased disorder, and that the dichotomy of official and private correspondence was unacceptable. If the company wanted order, he said. They needed to select a governor they trusted and give him the authority to enforce it. The investors agreed to the salary, and though they wavered on the issue of power, Butler took the job. They also set up a way for Butler to formally hear settler grievances, and they set up a civilian-led commission to investigate the magazine and accompanying Butler to the colony was Rishworth, who had been restored to his position of counselor after completely renouncing the petition as wrong. And the company yet again tried to recruit New Englanders, and this time they focused on those who had been pushed out during the antinomian controversy, most notably John Underhill, who had helped lead soldiers in the Pequot War, but who had then been exiled from Massachusetts for his support of Anne Hutchinson. Like many of the exiles, he hadn't just been kicked out, but also viciously slandered, and the Providence Island investors hoped that he would bring his distinguished background and colonial experience to their island colony. But instead, Underhill went to Rhode Island and then to New Netherland, where he worked as an Indian fighter. In 
The company also tried to recruit Ezekiel Rogers, a minister from Rowley, Yorkshire, but he decided to go to New England, where he founded Rowley, Massachusetts, which I got my notes a little mixed up earlier. Rogers was the founder of Rowley. Anyway, others that they were trying to recruit at the time included William Prynne's lawyer, Thomas Letchford, but Letchford also went to New England, though Letchford would ultimately return to England and write Plain Dealing, which was one of the most scathing criticisms of the New England way, a year before civil war broke out. But even though these negotiations fell through, the Providence Island investors decided to give their civilians yet more concessions, including the promise to survey the island's land and divide it up into plantations with permanent and even inheritable leases. And this was enough to enable them to recruit 131 more servants. But as they made concessions, they also set up a new council of war, consisting of Butler, Hunt, Axe, Alicia Gladman, and Andrew Carter. The council of war would take over exclusive control of the public works, militia obligations, maritime and military supplies, as well as the public use of slaves and even raising taxes for the construction of a powder house. They also gave the Council of War disproportionate say over giving people permission to leave the island. So this took virtually all power away from the governor's council. And because Hunt was the only Council of War member who was allied with the civilian faction, it essentially took all power away from the civilians and solidified military control of the colony and investors forbade colonists from importing any more slaves unless they had special skills like diving for pearls. Providence Island was by now the only English colony in which slaves outnumbered settlers, and the risk they posed was just too great. They had ignored it while they dealt with more dire problems, But after the Association Island Rebellion, they couldn't ignore it anymore. Even worse than a rebellion was the possibility that slaves might side with the Spanish in an invasion, which would virtually ensure the colonists' defeat. They had intended to get the slaves sold elsewhere, but financial problems had diverted their attention, so for now, they said just don't import any more, and keep the ones who were already there in small groups to minimize danger. They also forbade people from making a profit on slaves, saying that if they left the island, they must sell their slaves for no more than they'd initially paid for them, and Butler would be in charge so he could make sure. Butler and Rishworth arrived to Providence Island to find that the civilian faction had isolated themselves almost completely. Sherrod's congregation was a completely separate entity and had also declared its independence from the English church. They mostly emerged from their isolation to protest military behavior and advocate for the servants, And servants and slaves were also escaping on a regular basis, so their hidden community was also growing, continuing to evade capture, and only coming into town at night to take plantains, beans, and cassava from New Westminster to supplement the corn and livestock that they were growing themselves. And when Butler arrived on the island, he immediately showed how different he was to the other governors. He was well versed in the Renaissance theory of governance and had implemented it successfully in Bermuda. He treated both civilians and captains fairly, retaining all members of the governor's council. He spent every morning 
formally hearing settler grievances and disputes, which usually involved food or labor shortages or the magazine's 25% markup. And if he wasn't at his desk, he was overseeing militia exercises alongside Axe and Gladman. He always dined in company, usually at his own house, entertaining as many as a hundred colonists at a time. And he wrote and thought very highly of Sherrod's work as a minister and of his sermons. Butler was definitely a Calvinist, but he was barely a Puritan. He was easygoing, and he wasn't really averse to luxury, so he wouldn't have cared even if he had found people spending their evenings in riotous feasting. He was, and he was so tolerant of Catholicism that he even spent Christmas with the Spanish friars who were prisoners on the island. He was out to make peace with everybody, but from a position of strength and respect, which also allowed him to keep the island functioning smoothly. So you can see that if Providence Island was going to heal from its problems and survive, Butler was the guy to get it there. But he had obstacles, which had mostly been imposed from England. First and foremost was the Council of War. The biggest source of civilian resentment was the privateers, and moreover, the privateers fueled the resentment through absolute apathy about civilian well-being. And they did this on the Council of War, too. A couple of them used their authority to enrich themselves by charging people for permission to give up their land and go back to England. And some defrauded the company by selling the servants that the company had sent, buying slaves instead, and then using the slaves on their own private projects. They also continued to take all the best of the magazine goods, which forced the planters, who were poorer, to buy their supplies elsewhere, against company orders, and at a higher price. And obviously, the company had wavered in committing the kind of power that Butler said he needed to govern effectively. And obviously, Sherrod would disapprove of Butler's mellow tolerance. But exacerbating the problem was the long-standing company order that if the governor died or left before the company had nominated its successor, the colonists could choose their own governor. So if the civilians could make life unbearable for the governor with the opportunity to choose their own governor who favored their faction and who could even out the colony's balance of power. And I'm not sure if they'd figured this out at this point, but it really, really seems like they had. Within a couple months, civilians were telling Butler that they had written home that he was a Sabbath breaker, rioter, ravisher of other men's wives, an extortioner, a tyrant, and whatnot. Butler wrote to the company reporting this behavior and reiterating the need for the company to give him the kind of power that he needed to actually maintain control. The company needed to choose a man as governor in whom they had faith to govern, and then to trust him with power and back him up in conflict. If they didn't trust him then fine, they needed to choose somebody that they did trust. But if they refused to do this, they didn't even deserve to succeed. It's not all that different to the fight that Harvey had lost in Virginia or that Bell had just lost in Providence Island. But whereas Harvey and Bell were well-intentioned and competent, Butler was seriously capable. And even if they wanted to, the colonists simply couldn't avoid using slaves or importing more slaves. 
They had no other labor source, and crops required laborers. The company hadn't sent them for years, and when they did send a handful, those servants had been exchanged for slaves to profit the captains. The company wanted the colonists to produce commodities, and the only available labor source was slavery. So slaves continued to pour in, including 17 Pequots from New England, carried in New England's first slave ship, William Pierce's Desire, and then exchanged for Africans who were taken back to Massachusetts. Faced from news of the first two months of Butler's governorship, the company just didn't know exactly what to do. They suspected some magazine malfeasance, but they didn't fully know what was going on or who was to blame, so they simply eliminated the magazine and allowed the settlers to trade with whoever they wanted to. They acknowledged the slave issue and allowed the settlers to buy some more slaves as long as they didn't profit from them, and as long as they committed the slaves to working on public projects a certain percent of the time. And they demanded that the colonists at least get the escaped slaves back, preferably by fairly and gently enticing them, but if necessary, by capturing one to two and executing them as an example. An interesting side note here is that around this time, the company authorized none other than William Claiborne to set up a particular plantation within Providence Island's patent area. He wasn't on the main island, and his colonists would form their own government, though they would be bound by the laws of the main colony. There, Claiborne intended to trade with the locals and possibly do some privateering. But back to the main colony, just like with company finances, even though things should have been getting better, they were getting worse. And on May 1st, 1638, the slaves revolted. We don't know all that much about the events of the uprising, but it was over pretty quickly and without inflicting too much damage. The slaves probably had some indication that the English would be distracted by May Day, and they may have heard about the Association Island uprising. The biggest accomplishment of the day was to enable a mass escape of slaves and servants to the mountain colony. Not all the slaves revolted, and some of the ones who stayed loyal helped Butler to find a handful of escapees. And when he found them, he publicly executed them, along with 50 mutineers who hadn't escaped. The bulk of the runaway community continued to evade the English grasp, but the danger of slaves as a labor source had been proven, and Butler's retribution was merciless. After this, Rishworth decided to leave the island completely, going to Barbados, which was another newish Caribbean colony, but one which had neither adopted mass slavery nor privateering. But he and his family, minus one son, died within a year. And the island's civilians kept growing tobacco and isolating themselves from the rest of the colony. The company told them how worthless tobacco was, but it was the only thing that had ever brought them even marginal success, so they continued. I'm going to hold off on the commentary today because there's nothing I can really say that I haven't said before, and I may have been overdoing it. Frustration was at an all-time high on both sides of the Atlantic, and the ways in which Providence Island was unique have now created a situation in which, even though things should have been getting better, they were just getting worse. And next week, we'll look at the company's last attempts to turn the colony around.